Thank you for joining me again in this seven lesson series that I've titled Absolutely Trinity. This will be lesson two, plain and obvious proof text through the Bible, part one. The subject of theology proper or the study of the Godhead is the most important and profound subject known to mankind. To be mistaken in this area is fatal, rendering the soul lost and destined for hell. The Bible teaches that God is a trinity, meaning there is one God existing in three distinctly separate persons, namely God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. This union is so perfect, they are indivisible in essence, substance, unity, purpose, kingdom, and will. The Trinity is in no wise to be considered as three separate gods, which is called tritheism. The Trinity is not to be considered one almighty God who created the Son, making Him a lesser God and secondary to the Father. That doctrine is called Arianism. Finally, God is not one person that manifests Himself in three different modes or manifestations, as the Jesus-only adherents suggest. Our God is a triune God. He is a triune God that exists in perfect harmony without any deviation whatsoever. So in summary, God is a trinity, three in one and one in three. He is co-equal, co-eternal, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, uncreated, and coexists as three persons and not three parts. He coexists as three persons in one substance. He is indescribable, he is unexplainable, and he is unfathomable. There is nothing to compare him to. There is no means to measure him. There is no analogy that can accurately demonstrate him. The Trinity is three distinctly separate persons, yet one awesome God that is perfectly unified in essence and substance. Please, don't allow anyone to deceive you. The fact that you cannot adequately explain every minute detail about the Trinity does not diminish the reality of the Trinity. We need to learn everything we possibly can about the Trinity. And when we finished, we'll not even reach one side, top or bottom, of His Majesty. And I agree with what J. Oswald Smith said. To try and explain the Trinity is to lose your mind. But to explain Him away is to lose your soul. The Bible said in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. In the book of Job, chapter 11, starting at verse 7, the Bible said, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? God is an awesome God. Jesus' only believers love to bring out the point that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I love to bring out the point that the word Bible is not in the Bible. I like to bring out the point that the words United Pentecostal Church are not in the Bible. I like to bring out the point that the word apostolic is not in the Bible. Did you know the word incarnation is not in the Bible either? The word Trinity may not be in the Bible, but the doctrine of the Trinity is. The word comes from trinitus, a Latin noun that means threeness, the property of occurring three at once, or three are one. The Greek term used for the word trinity is trias, which means a set of three, and that's where we get our English word triad. The word trinity was first used in reference to the Godhead in about 200 A.D. by Tertullian. So the next time a Jesus-only person tells you the word trinity is not in the Bible, you just look them in the eye and you tell them that the word Bible is not in the Bible either, and just let them see how ignorant that that, uh, that argument is. And the Bible said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one blessed trinity. Now let's look at plain and obvious proof text through the Bible. And that's kind of where I want to start. I want to try to show you certain of the most obvious passages of Scripture giving plain evidence of the three separate persons of the Godhead. In our next lesson, we'll discuss the unity of those three persons. Point number one, Elohim. Now, the Bible said in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, here, God is the Hebrew name Elohim. It means God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used in the plural of the supreme God. 
In the Hebrew language, when M or I am is attached to the end of a word, it is plural like an S in the English language. In Genesis 1 and 1, Moses does not call God El, which is God in the singular. He does not call God Elah, which is God in the dual form. He called him Elohim, which is God in the plural. Genesis 1 and 1 can literally be translated, in the beginning, God of three or more created the heaven and the earth. The definition of Elohim is indisputable. Elohim is God in the plural. Since the Bible tells us plainly in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 that there is but one God, we know Elohim can mean nothing other than one God existing in three persons, a holy trinity. Now, a oneness adherent will try to twist what the plurality of Elohim means. They try to say that this speaks of a plurality of majesty. They use as an example the Anglo-Saxon kings of the 13th century. When they stood to make a declaration, those kings would say, We say thus and thus. One is people believe that that's all God is doing here. The problems with that idea are manifold. First, there is no record of anyone speaking in that manner until the 13th century. As a matter of fact, it's said that the Anglo-Saxon kings spoke in that manner because they were reigning over Christianized provinces and the kings were actually imitating God in Genesis chapter 1. Now, considering Moses wrote these uh, words here in Genesis some 2,600 years before the Anglo-Saxon kings were around, it would make sense that they would emulate God and not God emulating Anglo-Saxon kings. Now, Trinitarians know exactly what Elohim means and why Elohim is used 31 times in Genesis chapter 1 alone and 2,249 times in all the Old Testament. God is a trinity. Now, let me give you a tidbit of trivia. Christ never prayed to Elohim. Why He did not pray to Elohim is obvious. Elohim consists of three persons. One person of Elohim does not pray to Himself, regardless of what the Jesus-only people would like, to, would like for you to believe. Now let's look at our second point, the Trinity and creation. Here are a couple more verses showing the plurality of Elohim. Genesis 1.26 And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who is this us and our that Elohim was conversing with concerning the creation of man? Was he referring to himself as us? Was he talking to angels, created beings, when he said us? Brothers and sisters, God does not talk to himself, and we are not made in the image of angels. According to Genesis 1.27, we're made in the image of God. So who was God speaking to when he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness? Maybe this next set of verses will make it even clearer. St. John chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. First of all, the Word, Jesus, is said to not only be God, but be with God. In St. John chapter 1, verse 1, the word with means to be beside. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was beside God, and the Word was God. And that should help you better understand what God said in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Furthermore, St. John 1 and 3 tells us that Jesus made all things, which means He too is Creator. We now see that in Genesis 1.26, God the Father is speaking of God the Son and God the Holy Ghost in regards to creating man. We know from Hebrews 1 and 3 that the Father played an intricate role in creation also. From John 1 and 3, we know the Son played an intricate role in creation. But for anyone that would have any doubt as to the presence of the Holy Ghost in creation, I want to link two more verses up with what we just read. It will show the presence of all three members of the triune God in the creation of earth. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, God the Holy Ghost, moved upon the face of the waters. When Genesis 1, 1 and 2 is cross-referenced with St. John 1 and 3, we find all three persons of the Godhead in creation. When God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, it is obvious that it was the Trinity speaking their perfect harmonious will into existence. This, combined with the use of the name Elohim over 31 times in Genesis chapter 1, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God consists of three persons. Let me give you three more verses using the same wording. 
After Adam and Eve fell, God said in Genesis 3.22, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Hey, Mr. Jesus only, are you going to tell me that this too is a reference to the plurality of God's majesty? I don't think so. Now, when the Tower of Babel was being constructed, in Genesis 11 and 7, God said, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Again, when Isaiah received his threefold vision, God asked him in Isaiah 6, 8, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So his first question was, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Does that sound like the plurality of majesty? I don't think so. Point number three, I want to talk to you about Christ being sent. And so... This next verse that I'm going to share with you, it could be my favorite triadic or trinity verse. It clearly shows the plurality of the Godhead. Isaiah 48, 16. The Bible said, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and His Spirit hath sent me. Isaiah 48, 12 through 13 tells us who's speaking in Isaiah 48, 16. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am He. I am the first. I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. This is plain. Who laid the foundation of the earth? Who with His right hand spanned the heavens? It was the Creator speaking. Who is the Creator? Well, John 1 and 3 tells us all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1.16 For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. The Creator spoken of here is Jesus Christ. You see, the most revealing thing about Isaiah 48 and 16 is the sender and the one sent are both called Jehovah. It is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus speaking. Let me lay these verses side by side to show you more plainly. Isaiah 48, 12, 13, and then verse 16. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel. My called, I am he. I am the first, I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God in His Spirit hath sent me. Now the Jews believing that God is one person simply had no way of explaining how both the sender and the one sent could both be called Jehovah. They had enough sense to know that you cannot send yourself anywhere. And I'd, I'd like to have seen uh, you know, those two, two Jewish rabbis looking at this verse and one would have asked the other, said, Rabbi Malachi, how can Jehovah send Jehovah? And old Rabbi Lehi would have replied, I don't know, my brother. Let's move on to some other text that's more profitable. They had no answer. Isaiah 48, 16 is a very good example of doctrinal development between the Old and New Testament. How the Father revealed Himself in the Old Testament. How Jesus revealed Himself in the Gospels. And how the Holy Ghost reveals Himself to the church. So Isaiah 48 and 16 has Jehovah sending another who is also Jehovah. Now, of course, us Trinitarians know the Bible plainly states that all three members of the Godhead are called Jehovah. We'll deal with that in a later in a a later lesson. In Isaiah 48, 16, Jehovah Father and Jehovah Holy Spirit are said to have sent Jehovah Jesus. Anti-Trinitarians can do no better than their Jewish counterparts in explaining how the sender and the one sent are both called Jehovah. Now, I'd like to give you two more verses to prove that the one sent in Isaiah 48 and 16 is Jesus. Isaiah 61 and 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord, Jehovah, hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, that was the prophecy. Here is the fulfillment somewhere between six to 700 years later. In Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he's going to read mine to tell you Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. It says, Jesus took the book, and he's going to read Isaiah 61 and 1. 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So here, standing in a synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus began to read out of the book of Isaiah. He read Isaiah 61 and 1, and then said that what they had just witnessed was the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. What's so important about this passage? Jesus said the Spirit of God was upon him and had anointed him and sent him. The exact same wording of Isaiah 48 and 16. Lord God and His Spirit hath sent me. Isaiah 42 and 1. Bible said, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my Spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, there's many verses concerning Christ being sent that we could look at. But I want to look at a couple in uh, John chapter 6 and we'll quit. I want to start out with verse 38. Jesus said, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now this is a wonderful passage of Scripture showing the absurdity of the oneness doctrine. First of all, Christ said he came down from heaven. So that means he pre-existed his incarnation. Secondly, if he and the Father are the same person, he did indeed come to do his own will. Finally, he was sent from heaven to do the will of him that sent him. Who was it that sent him? Well, you find that in verses 39 and 40. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Remember, this was Christ saying that he was in heaven with his Father and was sent by his Father to the earth. Now, does that sound like they're the same person to you? Well, it doesn't to me. Now, the last point that I want to bring out concerning the Father sending the Son is that the fact that the Father sent the Son does not make the Son subordinate or less than God the Father. When the Bible talks about God the Father sending God the Son, it's speaking more or less of the office of the Father sending the office of the Son. It doesn't mean that Christ is subordinate. I'm going to give you an example. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Okay? One place the Bible said the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Well, number one, that kind of shows the stupidity of the Jesus-only doctrine anyway, how one mode of of God could lead another mode of God into the wilderness. It's absurd. But the point that I want to make right here is, we know very plainly that Christ spoke and, 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 and told us that it was expedient for Him to go away. He said, for if I go not away, the Comforter won't come. And He told us that He would not leave us comfortless, but He would send us another Comforter. Well, He also said that His Father would send another Comforter. Okay? So Jesus is said to have sent the Holy Ghost. Alright? Jesus is said to have baptized us in the Holy Ghost. But here we find the Holy Ghost leading, and one of the gospel writers said that he drove Jesus into the wilderness. And so in one place we find that the Spirit is subject to the Son. In Matthew 4 and 1, we find that the Son is subject to the Spirit. But Jesus is not less than the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is not less than Jesus. But in the office of Father, the Son is is in subjection. And in the office of the Son, the Holy Spirit is in subjection to Jesus. But all power has been given unto Christ in heaven and earth. Given by who? Given by the Father. Again, the same principle. Now the Bible said that the Father was the head of Christ. That Christ was the head of man. Man was the head of woman. Now again, the same principle applies here. The office of the Father is greater than the office of the Son. But in their divinity, they are co-equal. They are subject to one another, as I've just demonstrated. Matthew 4 and 1, Jesus was subject to the Holy Spirit. But you can go to the Gospel of John, when Christ gave us that masterpiece 
on the Holy Ghost and, and the Comforter coming and, and how He was going to send the Comforter upon us. Uh, we can read very plainly there that He's going to send the Holy Ghost upon us. And so it doesn't make anyone subordinate to either one or the other. They're just in subjection to each other. And they're sub- the Father is just as much in subjection to the Son as the Son is to the Father. So don't, don't let anybody cross you up with, you know, trying to tell you that because the Father sent the Son that He's greater than the Son. That means they're not a trinity. It's all a lie. And, and they're just trying to steer you away from the truth. So beware, okay? Beware. Hope and pray this lesson helped you. May God bless.